topical way, and that's all I needed to do then, was to get you to understand that fear in itself, when we start allowing familiar spirits, such as worry and anxiety and frustration, or over-concern about our children, or our finances, or whatever it may be, to take the center point of our lives, then what we've, do, what we've done is remove God from the altar of our hearts. Maybe inadvertently, but that's what happens. And then when we do that as believers, we actually give Satan legal ground access through doubt, through the audience. Now today, what I want you to understand is the what ifs that are in our lives are something that we conjure up. We start thinking by thinking old thoughts, by not bringing our thoughts into captivity, into the obedience of Christ Jesus. Now, I know this is all you know, theological. I know that it all sounds good. It's all written down nice and, and so that we can understand it. But it wasn't written down without experience. Paul, when he spoke about that, as well as in the other epistles, it was all through experience. It was filtered through God's word, but it was, it was alive through the experience of these people. Today, we all, now I don't know about you guys, but I'm gonna just say it like it is. I said last Sunday, and I don't apologize for it, that I see more fear in the body of Christ than I've ever seen before in my life. I see more fear of sickness and disease, more fear of what the government's going to do and not do, more fear, more fear, more fear, more fear, more fear, more fear, and less faith. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not condemning anybody, I'm just telling you what I see. I told you last Sunday, I see more and more people missing church for really no reason as compared to what they did several years ago. I see today that the people of God, and I call all of us, I'm not talking down to anyone, I'm talking to us. I'm telling you that when fear becomes more than a design, and you and I start living in fear, there's a problem. And that's what I see. See, it's okay when your pocketbooks are full or your bank account's full, but when you're challenged, all of a sudden you start, what if, what if, what if I don't make it? What if, what if, what if I don't have enough? What, you know, let me tell you something. God is the same God in times of need as well as in times of plenty. What you sow, you reap. Faith doesn't come because you come every once in a while to church. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith in itself, if it's not cultivated, dies. There is something called dead faith. And there's something called living faith. Today, what I want to talk about is the what ifs to present the problem that I see the other fear zone that the familiar spirits feed, and that is the what ifs. But in talking about that, I'm going to remind you about the solution that hasn't changed. Now, I'm going ahead of myself because that's what I do. I don't stay on script too much. I have it there and uh, so that I can go back and kind of anchor myself. But the thing, if I want you to stop and think back, there was something that was released upon the world several years back that brought in a whole dimension of a different kind of fear. Can anybody tell me what that was? COVID. And from that moment on, things and churches and believers, as well as the world, there was something different. Something happened. Many of the believers in the church became very much like the world. The world didn't become like the body of Christ. But then the, the government and different people, and I'm not being anti-government, I'm just telling you what I see and what you know and you've experienced. The government told us what to do, manipulated this, manipulated that, used that, but I believe it was Satan that used that to orchestrate something, to open up the door to fear. 
to fear zones. Whether it be about your health, about your children, your marriages, whatever we hold dear to us. It isolated us from one another. It caused people, instead of connecting physically, they were connecting virtual or on video or how ever they do it now. Hey, listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it all on TV. Yeah, but where's the, where's the rubbing of elbows? Or where's the, where's the, the sweat? Where's the, the, the love? You can't love long distance, guys. There's something that this did that I want you to understand. It was a plan of the enemy to do something. It opened the door, it isolated many believers, and they were kind of like islands under themselves. And after a while, they got used to it. I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit is moving, regardless of what people think, He's going to bring the local churches back together, He's going to bring the body of Christ, He's going to bring the remnant people throughout the world. He's going to bring the same thing that He did throughout the different ages. Except that this one is, I believe, what he's going to be doing just before he comes. Whenever that may be. I say just before he comes because I don't know when he's going to come. But I know that it will be in a season like it is the Feast of the Lord, the Fall Feast. I know it won't, won't be at the Spring Feast because he already came. It will be at the Fall Feast. So I know that sooner or later that we as the body of Christ to recognize that we were as Mordecai told Esther created for such a time as this we're created for that all that I'm talking about all the fear mongrels and everything that's going on right now I want you to know something in the midst of all that God is raising up a people a people it, it won't be the majority it never has been but it will be his people within his people it will be the two as compared to the twelve. It will be the two that said, God's word is true, the promises are true. And the other ten went back and said, well, the giants are bigger. It will be the two. It will be those who are hungry and thirsty for more of the presence of God. But with that, there are the fear zones that are more prevalent now than ever. Why? Because it's always the darkest part of the night before the light. No matter what. Even in the natural way that we understand things. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that we will stay clear of fear zones, Father God, by knowing them. Last Sunday, we talked about familiar spirits. Today, I want to talk about the topic of the what ifs. And what I've done in, in my notes, you might want to put it there to help you understand where I'm going with this. In my notes, when I put the topic, the what ifs, I also put in parenthesis, versus God's I wills. Versus God's I wills. Because you see, the what ifs are directly against God's I wills. God's I wills. The what ifs are what we think when we become double-minded. What we think when we start living in fear. We limit God's promises to what we can understand instead of what He has decreed. Now, will you be challenged? Yes. And there are some what-ifs, I'll be blunt with you, there are some what-ifs that will come to pass. But when you're in Christ Jesus, it changes everything. Because he's with you no matter what. He will go walk with you through the fire, through the floods. He will be with you. Amen. The previous readings that I gave you Sunday, I'm just going to call them out, but we'll, we'll go directly to the foundational readings for today. But last Sunday we spoke about Job, chapter 3, verse 25, where Job, the word of God says, the thing that Job feared the most came upon him. We talked about Psalm 37, 23 through 32. We talked about Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11. And then we read our text reading 
which is Psalm 34, verses 1 through 22. That's our text reading. But the text verses that we had Sunday are the same ones that we have today, as well as the theme. The theme for today is the same as Sunday because it's a continuation. For the spirit, for the spirit of fear to exist, it has to feed off of something. For the spirit of fear to exist, it has to feed off of something. That's the theme. That's where fear zones come from. It has to feed off of something. And it can't feed off of anything that you don't think about. If you're thinking about something that's contrary to the Word of God, then it feeds off of that. If you're thinking about the Word of God, then your mind feeds off of that. And you may say, yeah, but Pastor, I can't think about it all day long. You breathe all day long, right? By the same source, the same power, right? So therefore, you can think about the Word of God. When you want to get angry at somebody because they've done something ugly to you, you can retaliate. You can be controlled by the flesh, called a reaction. Or you can respond by the spirit and not be controlled by that person. Well, Pastor, you don't know how hard it is. Yeah, that's why we're supposed to walk in the spirit. It's a decided decision that we make every moment of the day. Now, the Psalm 30, 34, our text reading found in verses 4 through 6, is this. It says, I sought the Lord. And what? He heard me. And he didn't just hear me, did he? What did he do when you saw him? He delivered me from all my fears. Remember our text reading, our text verses are verses 4 through 6. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lighted, and their faces were not ashamed. Are y'all with me? Amen. Now you know that I do keep, teach from the King James Version, right? So if you have something slightly different in your word, know that I'm teaching from the King James. Okay, so it should, if you have a, a legitimate Bible, it should be the same. A few words different, but the same heartbeat. Amen? The same heartbeat. Word of God says, and their faces were not ashamed. Verse 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Let me ask you, with all that said, what is the common denominator? All. He delivered us out of all our fears. He delivered us what? Out of all our troubles. All, 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 all. God is not limited. Who limits God? We do. The Amplified says it this way. I sought, inquired of the Lord and required Him of necessity and on the authority of His word. And He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant. So your confidence is filled with hope. Abounding, brimming over with hope and excitement, with expectation. They looked at him and were radiant. Their faces shall never blush for shame or be confused. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, as always. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord with each one of my brothers and sisters, and I'm so excited today, Lord. I'm so excited about what the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into. I thank you, Father God, that there's a never-ending quest for truth through your word, Lord. Father God, we know that it will strengthen us, and we know that it reminds us of who God is to us and who we are to Him if we press in as His adopted children. We are, according to the Word of God, in Romans 8, 12 through 18, we are, according to Him, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and our Savior, yet we're joint heirs with Him as adopted children. 
and we're heirs of God, what the Word of God says. Do you realize the privilege and the opportunity that's given to us through the blood of Christ? Father God, I thank you, Lord God, that Father God, we will not allow fear zones of familiar spirits that we have seen in our lives and that we have done in our lives to affect us individually or collectively. And Lord God, I thank you, Father God, that Lord, we will see doubt and anxiety and double-mindedness for what it is. When we operate in that, Lord God, we open up the door to familiar spirits. And these familiar spirits, Lord God, allow different thought patterns to once more form. They form triggers that come. And you know what I'm talking about. All of you know what I'm talking about. You all have different triggers. I have a different trigger. We all have different triggers. Different situations and circumstances seem to cause those triggers to rise up. And if we're not careful, we don't have a brother or sister, someone to stand with us, then sometimes it's easy to open that door. And the thing is, once you open that door, it's like a floodgate. It's like me when I, I get off of sweets and I say, I'm just gonna taste and see. And before long, I've eaten a whole cake. And this is something a lot worse. When you taste and see of something that that God has delivered you from, you're gonna open up a whole floodgate of something that's gonna cause a lot of problems in your life. Triggers, triggers, because they are through wrong thinking, through familiar spirits. How do they come? Well, they come through the media, but I'm not gonna blame it on the media. Because you see, you have two years and what you do with what you hear in the media, either it calls you to rise up in faith or allow it to set triggers. I told you last, last week that many times we aggravate the problem and open up the door by making the internet our God. We go in there to seek what the internet has to tell us and we come out with every symptom, every plague, everything that could possibly happen to anyone, we all of a sudden start thinking on those things. The same thing with the media, no matter how you cut it up, when it uses you, it's like COVID-19. It opens up the door to many dimensions of fear and triggers in your life. That calls you to think about things that you've been delivered, about, delivered from. You can't be delivered from something and taste and see. When you're delivered from something, you need to stay as far away from it as you can. Fear zones. What causes you to fear? Well, Pastor, you know everyday life. Yeah. And different seasons produce different triggers in our life, depending on circumstances and situations. Today, when you look at the things that trigger, I'm going to use media, for instance, but I'm also going to use association. Because you see, the media in itself only feeds the thoughts that are, are still wanting to be tasted. A lot of times when you see things on the media, you allow these things, what they call influencers, for a reason. Well, Pastor, you don't, you don't, you don't understand. I'm strong. I'm solid. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be influenced by anything that is contrary to the Word of God. And I will tell you, the Word of God says, "Take heed, lest you do fall." Don't enter into pride, because pride, no matter how it dresses up, is still pride, and pride does come before the fall, destruction, and everything that is contrary to the Word of God. A lot of times, these different triggers, familiar spirits produce those thought patterns through triggers. And they come through associations, including what we're listening to, and that's what it's talking about the media, but it also comes as 1 Corinthians 15, 33 talks about, your associations. Now, I know that we are not of the world. We're in the world. I know that we work in the world. I know that many people that we talk to and many friends that we have are not born again. And there are many friends that we have that are born again that have compromised. And there are many people who are very religious and very well principled 
and morals are in line, but if they don't build you up, then you need to set limitations to how much time you spend with them. Oh, Pastor, how can you do that? It's simple. If it doesn't build you up, then you can't build them up. You've got to understand there is different, you have to understand that's, uh, that association or lack of association does the same thing. If you are associated more with the world and the people of the world, then your thinking will become diluted. If you are not associated with the brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, no longer assembling yourself in the body of Christ, then that too will cause a problem. You say, well, wait, listen, all the, the believers I know are hypocrites. Well, you know, the thing is this. A hypocrite is only a hypocrite as long as he confesses to be a hypocrite. Because you see, when you truly, sincerely come before the Lord and you declare the fact that He and He alone is able to stand in complete and total truth, because He is truth. A hypocrite is someone who says something and does something else. When you say you're a believer and don't go to church, which is the greatest hypocrite? The one that says he's a believer but forsakes the assembling of one another. Yeah, but you know, everybody, the people I know, they go to church, they talk about each other, they, they do their thing, just like the world, well, then shut your mouth, the bridle your tongue. If you're saying things and talking about people in the body of Christ or anybody else for that, for that matter, then the simplest matter is if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. So we know that triggers are set by associations or lack of association. We know that it's by the media, right? The Word of God says that there's something else that causes triggers in our life. It's called participation. Well, the Word of God says in Ephesians 5.11, go there with me please. Let's back up a little bit and go to verse 8. If you don't mind, we'll go all the way through verse 11. Ephesians chapter 5. The Word of God says in verse 8, For you were sometimes darkness. Again, let me ask you something. The epistles. Who is this for? The church, believers. Is it for the world? No. Why is it not for the world? Because there, there's no need to bring something to them that they can't walk in because they're, they're dead in their sins. They are the old nature. The epistles are the same thing, as I said, paralleling that uh, many times before. The epistles to the New Testament is what Deuteronomy is to the Old Testament. It is to teach us how to live in the covenant promises as Deuteronomy was to teach the people of God in the wilderness how to live in the covenant promises. So the, the, the epistles are instructions in how to live in the gift of salvation by grace through faith. But it doesn't remove the accountability nor the responsibility we have to walk as children of light. That's what the word of God says. It says this, well, you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Are y'all with me? Then what does it say? Walk as what? Children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now this is what I meant by participation. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of what? Darkness. Of darkness, but rather reprove them. Yeah, first association, first Corinthians 15, 33, as well as lack of association, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, but we also have participation. These things, brothers and sisters, have opened up the door to living in fear more than ever before. I can tell you, COVID-19 was something that was well planned. I don't care what anyone says. It is a 
calamity or tragedy is terrible. But it was used to do a lot more than what people understand. I'm not going to keep on going and talking about something that we've talked about many times before. But I want you to understand what it introduced and what I've seen. And you don't have to believe me. You can sit back, sit by yourself, get the word of God out, let the Holy Spirit show you. Take a moment from the moment that happened and ask yourself what has happened to my interaction with the body of Christ. What has happened with my walk of faith since then? And what is happening right now? Because see what people don't understand. The word of God does say, without a shadow of a doubt, that he said lawlessness will abound in the latter times. And the love of many shall wax cold. Ah, that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. You know, I love everyone. I really do. Even those who don't like me. I love everyone, even my enemies. But I'm going to be very picky who I choose to stand with you on the battleground. Very picky. Because, you know, it is my life and the things that God has provided for me and for y'all is at stake here. There are many, 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 many mega churches right now that are undergoing a redesign, so to speak. I take that serious. Because I know <coughs> that absolute power corrupts absolutely. I know that anyone that thinks they and themselves have got it all together outside of Christ is already lost. I know that the Lord God calls us to walk in humility and humbleness without compromising the word of God. The what ifs that come in, they are the little brush fires that you don't think that could cause a, a big, big problem, but it's the brush fires the little sparks that come off from these familiar spirits, from these triggers, from the what ifs that cause the, the destruction in your life and in my life. The Word of God says that if you become double minded, you shouldn't even think that you should receive anything from the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, as a believer in Christ Jesus, we're told that we have the mind of Christ. When do we have the mind of Christ? When we lay our will down and take up His. Did not Jesus say, Nevertheless, Father, Thy will be done. Not my will, but Thine will be done. Today I ask you, does the Word of God say that again, as I mentioned Sunday, last Sunday, does the Word of God say that that we are to be uh, people that talk faith and and not walk by sight. No, it says that what we're to walk by faith and what not sight. It says that you are to be, and I am to be, the ones whom the Lord God has given authority to tread upon the line and the cobra the the adder. The word of God says again that you know he gave authority to his disciples, right? To do something. To bring the gospel to a world full of vipers. Demonic attacks against us. But how can we give something to the world that you and I are not willing to walk in? You can't. We all are subject to fear at different times. But again, let me emphasize this. When we're living in fear, that is a dominating regional spirit, what I call a territorial spirit. And the thing about territorial spirits, think about it, think about it. A territorial spirit is just like a, a dictator or somebody that, that is a predator. It doesn't settle for just part of something. Territorial means it wants to confiscate everything in the vicinity. When we start living in fear, 
It wants to dominate your whole life. You start looking at your body more and what your body can't do instead of what God says it can do. You start looking at the years that have passed you by, and I'm one of those who can say that. Being three quarters of a century old is a privilege. My brother and my sisters were texting because it was um, it was one of, it was my brother's birthday. His name is David, by the way. He just turned 73. And if he watches this, he don't get upset. <laughs> he just turned 73, and he always wants me to say, when I introduce him, my little brother, he's bigger than I am. But he prefers my little brother to my younger brother. Because, you see, he says, now, Eric, how old are you? I said, Dave, you know how old I am. I'm 75 years old. I'll be 76 in February. That makes you two and a half years younger. You sure? I said, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm not fearful in certain things concerning my body, but there are triggers concerning my concerns, and I have to be very careful. One of the biggest concerns I have when triggers things in me that doesn't belong is all of you. Because I care so much for you. I want the best for you. And I wish I could change things in your lives, but I can't. Only God can. And my wife, naturally. I want the best for her health all the time. But these are things that, that are normal until they start to control you. It becomes a fear. What if something happens? What if she gets in a wreck? What if y'all get in a wreck? What if I miss something? What if I, what? And God tells me, he says, you're not God. You're not me. You can't change them. I can. I will. And that's the first I will that you need to remember. It's God that will. Not you, not me. Amen. It's God. And I'm so grateful for that. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so grateful for that. Because all of a sudden, man, these new shoes that I got, I bought a lightweight. But it's not that that's not what makes me feel light. It's because I was carrying a burden that didn't belong there. Fear has a way of getting into your life. But brothers and sisters, I will not live in fear. You hear me? And I charge you as God's people not to live in fear. Not to submit to these triggers. Not to submit to these what ifs. Not to become double-minded. Not to be fear, fearful. Oh Lord, Lord God, I got an ache in my back, so I must have cancer. Oh, I got a, I got an ache in my chest, so I must have a heart attack. Stop with all that. Come on now. You know what I'm talking about. It's easy because, and you got to be careful who you tell that to. Oh, didn't your dad die of a heart attack? Didn't your mama die? did Hey, listen. Don't stop with all that mess. However they pass, they pass, but that ain't me. That's not you. Amen. You're set free when you walk in the truth, the truth that you know that you walk in. I added that by permission, because you see, everybody seems to know the truth, but until you walk in it, you still are in bondage, even though you know the truth. You gotta walk it out before you set free. Amen. You gotta see the chains fall before you set free. And you see the chains fall through your spiritual man. For the word of God says he's not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Some translations say a balanced mind. But regardless of how you cut it up, it means that you see things through the biblical eyes of the word of God and through the power of the word that is alive in you. Amen. God did not give us a spirit of fear, Sister Patty. He gave us the spirit of what? Power! Love in a sound mind. But if you're walking and living in fear, you can talk the talk all you want, but you're still in bondage. Come on. 
You can say God redeemed me from sickness and disease, by stripes I'm healed. All those things are true. He's cleansed the blood that man's hands are not cleansed. The Lord God plucked up that which is not been polluted. The Lord God's plans are greater than ours. Jeremiah 29, 11. We can go and quote every scripture and we can, hallelujah, all we want. But until you start walking in that, until you start focusing on that, every trigger that Satan can throw you away, he's more dedicated than you and I are. He's more dedicated to your destruction than we are to Proving God's word. Say we want to talk about it, but we don't want to prove it. Because when you've got to prove it, it means it's on your back. You say, well, wait a minute. God empowers me. Yeah, but he wants you to take the steps. Remember what I told you about Peter? Peter said, come. Peter said, if that's you, Lord God, say, come. And Jesus said, what? Come. Now, did Peter say, well, I'm coming. It didn't come out. He said, hey, well, Lord, I'm coming, but just wait a moment. No, when he said, come, it was up to Peter to do something. He had to, first of all, step up outside of his comfort zone into that which was not comfortable. That was the water. Right. No land in sight. No land But guess, who did he have in sight, brother? Jesus. Jesus. A rock. Hallelujah, a rock. Oh, I can say it again, brother. A rock. A rock. The rock. Hallelujah, praise God. So this is what we're talking about. When we start focusing on the what ifs in our thoughts, it's kind of like this. How many of you as a kid still remember finding a pretty day like today if you had the opportunity to lay on your back somewhere and you're looking up at the sky and all these clouds started to form and you know, you were thinking about good things and then formed all kind of good things, you know, maybe a heart, maybe you had a crush on somebody and formed a heart, or maybe it's a flower or a bird or whatever. But in this case, I liken it to a small cloud in the sky. You see, if you focus on the wrong thing long enough, you can see pretty much what you want to see, like Job did. The thing that you fear the most is coming upon you. Church, we know there are many fear zones. We've talked about them off and on here and there, but you know, you can never get away from that. Because fear is something that puts on a different mask, but it has the same plan. That's to undermine the authority of God's word that says, I will. I will do this. I will do that. You see, the problem that Satan had to begin with was that he couldn't submit to the sovereignty of God's I wills. He wanted to walk in the what ifs. What if I can be as great as God? Look at me, I'm still, I look good. I got all the pipes. I, I can, people follow me because I, I sound good. I, I sing good. I'm musical. This and that. And a third of the angels followed him. And they all fell with him. See, he was in the what ifs because he couldn't submit and surrender to the I wills, the sovereignty of God. Because you see, the I wills that I'm talking about that contradict the what ifs not only speak about the authority of God's word, but it speaks about the I am of God. The I am, I am that came before Moses and said, tell my people when he said, who shall I tell them? What name shall I give your people? So that they know that I'm not just talking. He said, tell them that I am. I am. It's come down to the living. Church, we know those many fear zones, especially in today's times. They seem to be intensified even more so in believers' lives. And I've said that. I'm not going to apologize to anybody. I see that. You may not see that. You may say, well, I don't, I don't receive that. Well, you don't have to receive it. I see it. I'm charged by God to see what I see, not to condemn, but to encourage and to warn. The first person I start with is me and my household. Every time that something comes about, the first thing I do is, Lord, I say, Father God, please, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Not out of condemnation. A believer should never, ever, ever, ever be condemned. Convicted and chastised, yes. But a true, genuine believer should never be condemned. 
but chastised? Yes, convicted. I hope so. I'd rather us be convicted before we have to be chastised. Because believe me, God doesn't have a problem chastising those whom he loves. In fact, his word says he chastises those whom he loves. Amen. <clears throat> Church, again, I personally believe that's what COVID-19 was designed by the enemy to do. Because it's really all about the release of the spirit of fear universally. And when I say that, I mean the world and the body of Christ. The spirit of fear controls. The spirit of fear controls. The only truth that can destroy the what ifs that come at all different seasons of our lives is the rock solid truth of God's word. Applied continually with the I wills of God. Brother, again, read for me in the Amplified, if you will, Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16 of Psalm 91. I want you to hear just the foundational truth of what God says when we do what we need to do. Because he was set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name. He has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love, and kindness, trusts and relies on me, knowing I will never forsake him. No, never. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Father God, I thank you for that, Lord, because the I wills are very apparent in here, Lord. It all comes from verse 1 of 91, when we dwell in that secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty. We will say of the Lord, He is, not was, not will be, but He is our refuge and whatever we need of Him to be. But he says this, he says, because we have set our love upon him, therefore will I, in other words, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. That's the rock, brother. Because he knows and understands my name. Has a personal knowledge of my mercy. That's what we talked about Sunday, brother, which you brought up the compound names of God. The personal knowledge of the nature of God. That's why when we talk about the, the what ifs, that's not the nature of God. That's our nature. But the I wills of God are his nature, his characteristics. What he says he will do, he will do. It's impossible for him to lie. And he's not the son of man that he should repent. He's God. It's impossible for him to lie. So when we say that, when he says we have a personal knowledge of his mercy, his love, his kindness, and trust, and we rely on him. Knowing I will, he says, knowing I will never forsake you. No, never. We call upon him and I will answer him. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. Isn't that what Psalm, isn't that what Psalm 34 said? I will, I will deliver him from all his fears. I will deliver him from all his troubles. That's in our text, right? So he's, he's reiterating that. He's reemphasizing. He should call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Brothers and sisters, you know something? We choose to be either fearful or fearless. You as a believer, I as a believer, we have a choice. Those who in the world do not have a choice unless they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. But they are what they are because the God of this world has blinded them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you and I, as genuine believers, we have to make a, de a decided decision every day. And please, don't get in a rhetoric or don't get in some type of... of uh, Easy say, easy go type thing. Oh, I fear nothing. I fear. Because let me tell you something. When you say something like that, God also gives the enemy an opportunity to challenge what you're saying. 
The word of God says, for uh, as a warning, he says, be careful. He says, you know, Satan is as a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Now he doesn't want to devour the world. He's already got the world in the grasp. How many of you know that the world in itself, whether they believe it or not, they in themselves are dead according to the word of God. God came to save the world. We were all damned. Every one of us sitting in this chair. When we were born from our mother's womb, when we came into this world, we were all damned. That's why God sent His only begotten Son to save the world. Those who call upon Him, those who come to Him and receive Him as Lord and Savior. It opens up a whole new door. Listen, when I first came into the Lord, I, I didn't, and I, I don't mind saying, I didn't fear anything because, listen, I had just come out of jail. I had just been set free from, from uh, sickness and disease. I had a whole new opportunity. I mean, I'd been to the place where I was bankrupt and everything that was there. I knew what the worst fears were. I was the first one in my family, a whole generation of people that ever had to go through a, a, a bankruptcy and, and everything else that goes with it. I was in, uh, 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 you know that, I, and I don't, I'm not afraid to tell you um, so a testimony of that. I was in a, a, a behavior, a medical clinic for being a bipolar. I've seen all these things happen. The worst that can possibly happen, the what is, because I'm always worried because my, my dad and my mom had uh, that generational curse on them of being a bipolar. So I was always fearful of that. I wanted the chains broken off of my children. I didn't know how to do it. God delivered me from that. But the walk in itself is not being delivered, it's walking in deliverance. Apart from living in fear. Now when I first came into the Lord, I told you all before, the first thing that, that happened to me was that I was so, oh, I was so filled with gratitude because I had hope and I had an opportunity for a second chance that was more than a second chance anyone could ever possibly imagine. But for the longest time, uh, and when I was driving my car, Brother White, I was constantly looking in the rear view mirror to see if there was any cops following me, any policemen following me. Because I lived my life like that when I was a drunkard and when I was a drug addict. I always was wondering whether or not I was staying in the right lane. And don't you know that I was worried about that one time? I was going to a, a, a meeting uh, with uh, the pastor, and I was going, and don't you know a cop stopped me? And he said, you got to light out. Don't you know that I told him, I said, I'm just going to a church meeting. He said, go. Don't you know, a week later when I was going, uh, man, I forgot my wallet, which I do every once in a while. Thank God my wife's with me all the time. I forgot my wallet at home, and they had a traffic stop, and they were checking lights, and I didn't have one. And you got to know from where I came, man. I, I just been, you know, like I said, I had several OWIs in the past and all this kind of mess. So, you know, I did not want to be in the light of the law, so to speak. But then I realized I'm set free. I'm not the same person I used to be. And I sat there and I told the, the policeman when he checked, he said, where's your license? I told him I was honest. I said, man, I forgot. He looked at me and told him by the grace of God. I had my Bible on the side of me. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excuse you this time. He said, now he was a state trooper. And I, I told him, I said, you know something? I'm going to, when I get back to me, I'm going to go get my license. And I'm going to go bring it to you. You know what I did? I did exactly that. I found him and I showed him to let him know that his trust was underneath. Why am I saying all this? Because you see, it's easy to live in fear from your past, your triggers, and all those things. They look for a season to put a grip on you. Today, it's worse today, not me personally, but us collectively, as the body of Christ. If you speak the truth, you stand in the truth, and you, you love with all your heart, you're still a bigot, 
you know, because you're speaking the truth. How can people get set free? How did that policeman allow me? He didn't allow me to, to go free. He gave me the courtesy of allowing my word to mean something. Today, because of the platforms that, that are set up, people are afraid to live for the Lord. They'd rather live in fear. I'm not going to live in fear for nobody. Jesus Christ died on the cross so I would be set free so that you and I can worship Him. You can't worship the Lord if you're living in fear. You can't worship the Lord when you're confused. You can't worship the Lord when you're double-minded or you have doubt. I'm not saying you don't love the Lord, but you can't worship Him. And Satan is just waiting for that opportunity. He's waiting for you to give Him place. But the Word of God says in Ephesians 4, 27, don't give place to Satan. We choose to be fearful or fearless. The choice is ours, Brother Jonathan. But our choices are fueled by something. Either fear or faith. The Word of God does say to us, doesn't it? In Romans 10, 17, doesn't it say that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God? Well, can I tell you something? Fear cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of Satan. Or the Word of the old man. Or the Word of lack of trust. Or the word of the world, or the word of the media, anything that's kind of whatever you listen to more will either influence you to walk and live in fear or to walk and live in faith. Your choice. You see, I've learned through the years fear stalks us. It does, it, it stalks us. And when we least expect it, it grabs us with a relentless grab, grip. It refuses to let us go or lose its hold and fear sets in as an uninvited, uninvited companion. And again, as I said, suddenly fear in itself by God's design is for our protection. It causes an intense adrenaline flow to create something in us called a defense mechanism or system. But I am talking about living in fear, which is totally different than fear by design. Church, living in fear comes from a strong man, as I said earlier, that is territorial in nature, meaning it wants to expand his dominance over your life through control and confusion to the point where doubt begins. And when doubt begins, it destroys our foundational beliefs of God's promises to his people. Now, Proverbs 3, 24 through 26 says, when he lies down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, when you lie down, our sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear. That's Proverbs 3, 24 through 26. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be your confidence. The Lord shall be your confidence. Satan has, from the beginning, says the flow, majored in the what ifs because he couldn't submit to the honors of God, the sovereignty of God. Fear zones are where Satan, hear me well, please, you don't hear anything else. Fear zones are where Satan disarms a believer, disarms a believer through doubt. Anxiety, double-mindedness, compromise. Because we start to lean on what we're more familiar with. And usually towards the what ifs than the our wills of God. Because you see, the what ifs are something that we always fall back on as compared to the I wills, which means that we have to press into. See, the, uh, the what ifs we fall back to, but the I wills we have to press into. That's what the Word of God says in Philippians. It says, press toward the mark of the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, my brothers and sisters, the what ifs are the paths of least resistance, and the high wills takes a deliberate choice moment by moment 
And day by day, no matter what you see or feel, to stay connected to the ideals of God. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. So no matter what, when you bring forth your tithes and offerings in accordance to the word of God, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. I never preach on tithing and offering. Why? Because it's in the word of God. If people want to debate about it, debate with God. I have no problem either way because I know God's proven himself to me over and over again. And I'm so grateful for the fact that God does. He rebukes the devourer for me financially, for my health, my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. Because his word is true. His word is solid. Brother Clab usually talks about the, the truth on that. He's, he's a perfect example of what that truth that he stood in amongst others brought during a very, very tough time financially and emotionally in his life. But he came through, he's on top, standing strong, better than ever, because the same God who was with him then is still with him now. Amen? We must feed ourselves God's word more than our own reasonings. Why? Because Satan is more determined than many believers. He wants to exploit your weakness. He's more determined to exploit our weakness than we are to reestablish our strengths through God's word. So it sounds, excuse me, that's what verse Peter 5, 8, and already quoted that for you about. See, Satan knows if he can get us back into the fear zone, his territorial grounds that have familiar spirits assigned to those areas in our lives, he has a legal place to operate from. Remember what we read in the Old Testament. You don't have to go there because I'm running out of time. We're in the book of Numbers, and, I, and I've brought it to you several times. Uh, Numbers 33, you don't have to go there. But it talks about when the Lord God would bring his, brought his people into the promised land. Physically, he told them that they were to dispossess the people of the land. And we know that spiritually it speaks to us today. We don't just dispossess people of the land, but we dispossess the old nature, the thoughts that we had in our own minds of how we used to operate. The Word of God says that when he brought his people, Sister Patty, into the land, he said, this is the thing that he told them. He said, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, this is in the promised land. How many of you know that doubt, anxiety, frustration, confusion, rebellion, all those things are the enemies against the promises of God in your life? Now, those things don't automatically go because you're in Christ Jesus. They go because you have the authority and you're called to operate in the authority of Jesus and his name. To dispossess that or those thoughts that you had before concerning certain things that are contrary to God's word. It says here, if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes. And spiritually speaking, what that means is those things that should not be in your way of thinking, they start to cloud and distort your vision that God has for you. You can't see clearly anymore because those things that you let remain start to distort your vision. And thorns in your sides. And what that means is they not only distort your, your vision of what God has called you to walk in or where he's called you to go, but the thorns in your side represent the fact that they weaken your walk, your faith walk. They weaken your faith. Talking spiritually, hypothetically, but spiritually. It says here, and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell, and will cause your mind. This is fear. Even though you are a co heir in Christ Jesus, even though you are an heir of God. Even though these promises belong to us, we've allowed by not taking care of business as we should by grace and through faith, we've allowed those things to cloud our vision for us to settle for less. 
We allow them to weaken our faith walk by allowing them to be like thorns in our side. And even though we have the promises operating in our life, they're limited because they're vexing our soul with fear and double-mindedness and doubt and anxiety. This is what happens when we start living in fear. And please don't come to me after this sermon and want to argue with me about whether or not you're living in fear or not. That's between you and God. Your fruit or lack of fruit will de declare that, just like it does with mine. Amen? Let me hear him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise the Lord. The Word of God says, don't give Satan place. Isaiah 43, 1b through A, says, fear not. Isaiah 43, verse 1, part B, through 3, part A, it says, fear not. For I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. I love that. I love that. We are his. We're no longer our own. He says, When you pass through the waters, I will. What? Be with thee. And through the waters they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Church, our trust level is not automatic because we're born again. I've told you before, trust is one of the smallest words, or one of the smallest vowel, smallest <coughs> alphabet in there, but it's one of the biggest things to walk in is trust. That's why Isaiah says that our trust and our faith is usually forged in the fires of affliction and adversity. Isaiah 30, 20, you can write it down. Church, when what ifs come into our lives, we must ask ourselves if we're going to judge God by the circumstances we don't understand. Darlene, take care, sis. Or judge the circumstances in the light of the character of God. So Romans 8, 28 is all about, it says all things work for the good of those who are called by God. It also means Jeremiah 29, 11. The plans of God are good, for us they're not evil. First Corinthians 2, verse 9. For no eye has seen nor ear heard what the Lord has planned for those who love the Lord their God. And Ephesians 3, 20. That he is able to do exceedingly above anything we can possibly ask or imagine according to the power that work in us. Church, I'm closing out with these statements. Isaiah 41, 10, and 13 declares, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We can trust God only when our focus is on Him, brothers and sisters, and not on our circumstances. Verse 13 says of that same reading, that's in Isaiah 41, verse 10 and 13. For I, the Lord, thy God, will hold your right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Church, in closing, remember this. Fear zones are real. Don't make light of it. Fear zones are real. I was watching a show the other night, and I'm not going to take long to say this. Watching a show, uh, show the other night, and it was called Far Country, I believe. And the way that they contained certain blazes or fires were that they would dig a trench uh, so that the fire couldn't jump over. And I thought about that. Because you see, what the Lord told me to tell each and every one of you, we are to big, dig deep trenches in our lives to keep those fear from advancing in our lives. 
There should be such a, uh, uh, a, a difference between that and our familiar spirits and territorial spirits and our walk in Christ. Yes, we see them, but we don't look at them as giants. Through God's eyes, we look at them as grasshoppers. But this doesn't work if we're not willing to go forward. If you're not willing to see where these fear zones have attacked you, where we've given a territory of spirit in our lives, where our choices about doubt and double-mindedness, how that goes hand in hand with compromise, with the world and worldly thinking. Because God's word, God's word says that people we have been given by association to our Lord Jesus, authority in his name to tread over all the power of the enemy. See, we've been given by association with Jesus, the authority to tread over all, that's that word again, all the power of the enemy. He says, I give unto you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you because God is not the source of fear. Instead, he is the source of power, love, and sound mind. Church, let's focus not only what is, but the I wills. Now I've got another part to this message that the Holy Spirit has given me. It's called Even Though. You see, we went from the fear zones of familiar spirits and triggers, living in fear, to the what ifs where they come from, to the I wills, and I'm going to go from the I will to another dimension called Even Though. Father God, I thank you in the name of Jesus that your word is all about building us up and equipping us, Father. We are in a spiritual battle, Father God, Lord. The war has been won by you. The victory is by you for us, but the war still rages. Lord God, the gift is free, but the journey is not. Satan hates the I wills of God. And it's going to hate even more, even those of God. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that your word is true. No matter the culture, no matter the time, no matter who says it's not, you say it is. And Father God, I ask and I thank you in advance that, Lord God, you watch over each and every one here today between myself and my wife and each and every one of us when we are absent from one another, Lord, that, Lord, it may be well with us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. would you give God all the glory?